All righty. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stefan Gorski, um, and I'm joined by Kenneth Tran. And we are in Professor Bernard's uh, Jazz Age in the 20th century. And today we'll be talking about various topics that are generally covered in the Jazz Age. You might learn a few things you've never known. You might learn a few more things about things you have known. Regardless, we're just here to have a nice little discussion. So Kenny, um, could you tell us in your own words, how would you describe racism in the jazz age? Well, first off, we should start off by talking about the jazz age. Jazz age was a time of individuality, change and creativity. However, I'd say it was also the prime time for racists such as the known, well-known Ku Klux Klan. And they had established their clear presence throughout the country during the 1920s. And they were prominent until the 1960s when the civil rights movement hit. And racism during, during the jazz age, in short, it was done through various acts. The more notable being the on-screen depictions of African-American characters in movies. And these African-American American characters were often portrayed by, you know, fair skinned people rather than by their own self. So this sort of made it more difficult for directors to want to cast a more diverse crew as it sort of went against, you know, traditional casting. Most actors were normally fair skinned people. African Americans didn't really have a role in the, in Hollywood back then and almost every single role was played by the traditional white man. So it sounds like uh, instead of including uh, African-Americans to even at least play their, the, their own selves, uh, Hollywood directors in that time with the biases they held, the racism they um, displayed, they decided that uh, it would be better uh, in their mind to cast white uh, actors to portray African-Americans. And uh, to follow up that question, uh, in the time you've taken this class and, and, and uh, reflecting on anything else you've learned about the jazz age, what was the most disheartening thing that you learned about racism in the 1920s and uh, in literature and filmmaking? Well, in short, I kind of learned that most of the racism went unheard for a majority of the jazz age period until people actually started to realize that jazz wasn't what they considered it to actually be. Even though it was like a time of, you know, creativity and awakening for musicians and artists and just regular people like me and you alike. Um, I thought that it was pretty interesting. I read a couple articles online with regards to the jazz age and its origins. And initially, some racists thought of the introduction of jazz into the regular music as, you know, they called it even jungle music. But when more and more fair skinned people started picking up jazz and liking it, whether it be through, you know, an intriguing connection and or experience they had with with jazz it was suddenly thought of as you know acceptable in society it was kind of shunned whenever you know jazz music would play at you know speakeasies or bars people would then lose business if they were to have black performers and i didn't really realize that there was so much underlying racism in most of the films during this time such as the chic we went over that in class we saw how the Arabian protagonist, the Sheik, was played by a fair-skinned man in such a way that kind of caused viewers to have this sort of image that Middle Easterners were savages and womanizers. And often these sorts of things are not taken seriously and they actually do directly harm the reputation of the ethnic group that is being represented in the film. And that, overall that was kind of disheartening for me to learn about in class. But like you said, it sounds like uh, once that 
and jazz and other uh, parts of African American cultures started being accepted by um, the uh, at the time more more racist mentality of of uh, white people. Um, it sounded like uh, people started judging art, like such as literature, music, and and films, not on the basis of who was performing in it or the race that was participating in these uh, works of art but more about the art itself and what kind of connection they had with it. Okay. Right. And um, <clears throat> lastly, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, what could have been done to mitigate the racism and discrimination of African-Americans during the jazz age? Oh, this is a tough one, but honestly, in my opinion, I think the most effective means of addressing these problems, if we were to reference the jazz age period obviously it was to be to be honest i guess we could attempt to try and reconstruct the already flawed system of repre representation of african americans in media we often see fair skinned people play the role of african americans as we see and these people are made out to be who they aren't Often they are ridiculous care creatures of themselves. And, you know, I guess we could have influential actors slash actresses they can do to try and raise awareness about the microaggressions that are obviously seen towards African-Americans in not only the film industry, but also in society as well that back then. The 1920s were, you know, indeed a time of liberation, but clearly we, did not see that with regards to African Americans, you know, in the film industry, you know, in movies, in literature, and also, you know, in society. And I just thought that, you know, we had, we went over a piece of work that mentioned chitterlings, which are a a sort of food that was fed to slaves back back in the day that Professor Bernard had talked about, a specific film had mentioned that multiple times. And I just thought that, you know, that's just indirect racism because it, I, I know a lot of people in class mentioned that, you know, they it's not something to be proud of. You know, it, it was kind of like a food that was, you know, fed to peasants and slaves and just like, you know, the utter use of that um, in, the, in certain films portrayed, you know, African Americans in a light that we really didn't expect to see. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to shift over the, uh, the podcast or reigns over to you. All right. Well, obviously, I'm Kenneth Tran, and I will be asking Stefan Gorski with regards to his perspective on women in the jazz age. So I'll start off with a simple question, you know, based on the presentation in class, what do you think was the catalyst for women to express themselves freely and without consequence during the jazz age? I think it's a very good question to open up this uh, line of questioning. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't think there's only, there was uh, one single uh, catalyst for women to be better to be uh, better able to express themselves during the jazz age but one of the big ones for sure was in uh, 1919 when they uh, when women were finally uh, they won the right to vote um, although their voices have been heard for uh, a long time now uh, through women's suffrage movements uh, they had been you know um, fighting for their for their right to express themselves politically um, and for a few uh, a long time now, creatively, uh, you saw women directors uh, or w women uh, writers, uh, women uh, directing power be uh, emerging, um, women uh, editing movies. That was a big one. Um, and uh, but apart from that, we also saw the massive wealth uh, uh, increase in the United States after uh, the First World War. There was an economic boom, which brought prosperity throughout a lot of the um, 
you know, upper middle class to, to a wealthy and even aristocratic uh, classes in the, in the United States. And I think a lot of the women uh, in those classes were greatly benefited from uh, that wealth and were able to express themselves a bit better artistically, politically, um, socially, sexually. Um, there was a lot of a, a lot of more open doors thanks to that wealth, and that kind of goes to show um, <clears throat> another issue that perhaps is a uh, uh, better left for another time. Uh, what kind of advantage that uh, wealth um, gives you? And uh, I, I would say a third reason also is that um, the hierarchy uh, shift today, uh, or sorry, the hierarchy uh, shift um, then uh, was immense. You saw. Um, you know, nobilities and classes, although there was still rich and poor, the official classes such as nobility royals in the United States start to disappear. You no longer had those, um, you know, uh, great, uh, you know, wealthy, massive fat plantation owners, families in the South. Um, uh, the uh, royal uh, crown no longer had the same weight as it used to before. And there was a lot of countries uh, whose royalty was dismantled after um, the First World War. So yeah, I think th those three reasons were, were probably uh, not the only, but uh, possibly the primary catalysts of women finally being able to uh, express themselves in the jazz age. Well, thank you, Stefan, for that you know, insightful answer. Um, moving forward, um, do you think that there is an inherent difference between a so-called flapper and a new woman? And if you do think so, what are the differences? Yeah, no. Um, so I, I don't think that there is a uh, major difference between um, a flapper and a new woman. Um, I think it's just a different level of expression uh, through, uh, it, it's basically what medium you choose to uh, express yourself uh, through in that age. For example, <clears throat> the classic flapper that most people will associate with, um, with that, that time period being, you know, like the bobbing hair, the short hair, um, the, uh, the short skirts, uh, you know, the glitter, the jazz, everything like that. That's like your classic flapper. And that's sort of meant to represent like the sexual and, you know, uh, bodily freedom that women were finally be able, uh, being able to express. Gone were like the, uh, <clears throat> the long dress gowns and, uh, you know, um, very conservative, conservative dress outlook and uh, uh, mannerism uh, expectation for women in public you are now able to, as a woman, you are now able to uh, say more things, express your opinions on um, political, uh, social, even maybe e economic matters uh, about art. And um, a flapper is just the physical embodiment of that. You had uh, new women back then, so many artists, so many uh, writers, uh, maybe even I would consider uh, Drew Stein to be one of those new women um, having a more, uh, not so much flamboyant impact, but able to express her voice creatively and impactfully uh, during that time. So uh, in short, do I think that the new woman and a uh, flapper are two different uh, people? No, it's just a matter of um, uh, an idea being expressed in different ways, but I think they have the same roots. Uh, agreed. Agreed, agreed. So the big question that I'm gonna ask you today, Stefan, is you know, what was one of the most cultural, culturally shocking things that you learned about the cultural shift and society during the jazz age? Because there was, a, there was a lot of like things that was you know, surprising that we learned in class, but what do you think is like the most you know, significant, most important shocking thing that you, yourself learned from taking this course? Sure. Um, well, uh, I think all my answers previously shed a positive light on the jazz age. Um, I talked about how uh, women were able to express their uh, opinions more, 
Um, I talked about how uh, there was this massive wealth influx uh, in the United States um, after World War I. Um, <clears throat> just America had so much money and there's so much money to be made. But unfortunately, that was more for the upper middle, uh, upper and aristocracy within the United States. Um, now we have to ask ourselves the question, what happened to the middle class and below? Well, um, unfortunately, most of those, most of the soldiers that fought during World War I, I believe um, were part of the middle class or below. And uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of cases, a lot of what was known at the time as shell shock, which we know to be PTSD today. Um, I, didn't, I, I did not know the, the massive impact that PTSD had on people back then. We had multiple presentations in class uh, saying or um, discussing like how PTSD and the horrors of war, what those soldiers, those young men, uh, what they saw in war, like what how that affected their outlook uh, when they finally returned home. We see examples of um, of these young men in literature, a lot of literature and uh, film. For example, we have. Um, uh, Jake Barnes in The Sun Also Rises, uh, Hemingway's um, uh, one of his most profound novels. Uh, he returns home, uh, whether figurative, figuratively or losing, uh, or, or figurative, figuratively, my bad, or literally losing something um, and uh, now having to, and literally being impaired uh, physically and mentally in, in his uh, everyday life. And uh, in, we have also uh, movies, um, such as the big parade, uh, King Veter's uh, one of uh, maybe arguably several magnum opuses that uh, depict uh, that scene with all the ambulances. I mean, I, with a with a name like the big parade, you would expect that uh, from war there was um, a great parade to be um, to welcome those soldiers when they finally get back home. But really, uh, King Vitor. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just depicts this uh, scene with all these ambulances, of course, uh, sheltering and helping all those poor uh, soldiers that were greatly wounded during the war. This is what returns from these great wars, from these great conflicts that the higher ups and countries lead, is that it's all these young men being damaged uh, physically and mentally. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, another thing is that uh, what I completely uh, didn't see coming or I, I like was left out of my analysis completely until the very end of our classes that when these soldiers were abroad, they had no control over the cultural, social um, and uh, political changes that or, or sorry, not, not control, but no say in those changes that were occurring back home. Um, we have uh, A Soldier's Home, which is a, another uh, Hemingway novel um, that uh, where I forgot the, the I think Krebs is the Screbs Krebs is the is, is the name of the uh, main character. Um, he comes home and he sees such a complex, glistening, active world, but he left it with a, um, you know, he left America um with a very, not, not a simplistic, but more simple outlook. Uh, he saw the world as more, maybe more black and white. And now he comes back from this, this war, seeing all these horrors and he expects the comfort of, of simplicity, but he's met with all this color and he does not interpret it. So I think a, a lot of people were overwhelmed with the changes that were happening so fast uh, during that time. Right, right. Well, Thank you guys for tuning into our podcast. Yes, um, this is a pleasure, uh, Kenneth. Um, yeah, this podcast, uh, if you haven't found it already, will be posted um, on the Film and Media Studies Instagram, uh, whose handle is William and Mary Jazz Age. Uh, we hope to see you there. And uh, it's been a pleasure, Kenny. It's been a pleasure with you too. It's been a while.